Okay. Great. So, so we'll. Okay. Just to start off, then, um, welcome to the, the this webinar. Um, whoever now there's a little world in the bottom of your your panel in which you could choose which language to listen uh, to. And I would uh, I'd like to request the speakers to put it in English because that means that everything that they'll be saying will be translated in Spanish. Um, so that that would be the beginning. So I'd like to first um, uh, welcome you to this uh, seminar, the critical role of methane in addressing the climate emergency. Um, as we've already alluded to, methane is the most effective way to tackle the crime, climate crisis this decade. A lot of things have happened since the launch of the Global Methane Pledge and the Global Methane Hub. All the recent science reports and what we're, we're gonna be exploring today reinforce the fact that methane mitigation will be central in our capacity to keep warming under 1.5 degrees. Um, we also um, ha have to carry out the sprint on methane mitigation to reduce warming within our lifetimes and a marathon uh, for this uh, century reducing CO2 emissions also. It's not either one or the other. These are mutually enforcing agendas. And we also have a fossil fuel war that's shown our dependency on dirty fuels and how it impacts our cost of energy and food systems. We have information that highlights that the globe, despite this global methane pledge, we have higher emissions resulting from oil and gas extraction this year. Today, we also have a report that uh, will talk about how we can increase how much we focus on methane finance and focus really on the biggest emissions and opportunities. We also know that methane mitigation is also a challenge for both the global north on the energy systems emissions, but also the global south, considering that 60% of emissions come from the food system at large. The methane hub was, um, which I, I have the privilege of, uh, of leading, has operated since February and we've moved fast. We've deployed and uh, funding uh, to those who need it and, and at the time that is required. We started off supporting the Climate and Cleaner Coalition. So we have at least 30 countries working on methane reduction plans. We've been supporting European countries to accelerate their independence from imported fossil gas in the context of their national climate and energy plans. And we will deploy funding the second semester to target mitigation on the biggest emitting countries. We also work with partners that have been long working on this methane space. Many of you are which participating today. Uh, this is a seminar that we are also hosting with IGSD, who have uh, kindly contributed to uh, making it happen. And we convene uh, the strategic space under which philanthropies can maximize their investment on reducing emissions. So therefore, I'd like to introduce Jürgen Thompson to kick off the webinar. Jürgen is a longtime environmental advocate with a successful career in promoting conservation, both in civil society and as a government official. Today, he is the director of the Climate Solutions at the MacArthur Foundation and is one of the members of our advisory board. So Jürgen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Um, it, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, Global Methane Hub webinar. And as Marcelo just mentioned, I'm the <clears throat> program director for climate solutions at the MacArthur Foundation, which is located in Chicago. And, and for me, some, some of the most exciting moments in philanthropy happen when funders come together to use their collective power to advance major climate solutions. It happened when philanthropy stepped up in support of the Kigali Agreement, uh, the landmark amendment to the Montreal Protocol that calls for a reduction of da dangerous HFCs uh, globally by 80% uh, by the year 2045. By, by establishing the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, 18 funders committed $52 million to help developing countries to transition to energy efficient, climate friendly, and, and affordable cooling solutions. And it happened again last year when 23 climate funders, including the MacArthur Foundation, came together to announce their intention to fund more than $300 million to reduce methane emissions globally and to create the Global Methane Hub. Our effort also includes supporting the diplomatic efforts spearheaded by the United States and the European Union through the Global Methane Pledge to reduce global methane emissions by 30% by 2030 and 50% by 2050. And, and as Marcelo just mentioned, re reducing methane emissions is the single most cost-effective 
an impactful opportunity to address the climate crisis at scale now. Methane is 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And in the past decade, global methane emissions have risen at a rate faster than at any time in the last 30 years. At least 25% of today's warming is driven by methane from human actions with the fossil fuel industry, agriculture, and landfills being the heaviest emitters. The, the recent global methane assessment and the IPCC's most recent assessment reinforce the urgent need to address methane emissions. Rapid methane reductions can reduce warming by as much as 0.3 degrees Celsius by 2040 and by more than 0.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And, and this comes in addition to the many health benefits gained from reducing emissions of methane's co-pollutants, including reduced rate of birth, asthma, low birth weight, and, and many other negative outcomes. MacArthur has been supporting methane reduction efforts for several years by supporting the work of groups such as the Environmental Defense Fund, Clean Air Task Force, Earthworks, and others at both, that work both at the regulatory and the enforcement levels to make this invisible threat visible, and at national and international levels to restrict these dangerous emissions. But what really motivates us and what should motivate all of us is how methane further exacerbates inequality caused by the climate crisis and disproportionately harm the most vulnerable amongst us. And as we said at Glas in Glasgow last year, this is the methane moment. And, and with that, again, welcome everybody. And I'll now turn it back to Marcelo to introduce the first panel speakers. Thank you so much, Jurgen. Um, yes, and, and thank you uh, so much for your support um, in, in moving this agenda forward. I think the moment in which you seized on is has been an excellent opportunity, and we hope to uh, fulfill that um, that mandate of uh, coordinating the efforts on methane mitigation in the philanthropies. Uh, so it's it's my pleasure to welcome the first panel of speakers that will highlight the latest developments on uh, methane uh, and climate uh, science. Each speaker will have brief remarks that will uh, open up to a 15 minute uh, Q&A period. And then we'll have a second, um, second panel discussing mitigation, adaptation, resilience, and remaining gaps. I'd also encourage our uh, speakers to ask questions to, uh, to one another to stimulate the discussion. For those in Zoom, you could uh, ask uh, questions through the Q&E button. And uh, on YouTube, you could submit them in the comments section. I'd like to first stop, start off with Rob Jackson. Rob Jackson, Jackson is a Michelle and Kevin Douglas Provisional Professor and Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment and the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford University. Uh, Professor Jackson and his lab uh, examine the many ways that uh, people affect the earth. Uh, Professor Jackson also chairs the Global Carbon Project, uh, international research partnership, integrating knowledge to produce global budgets on carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. He's also a Guggenheim Fellow and recipient of the Presidential Career Early Career Award in Science and Engineering for the National Science Foundation. Um, Rob, uh, thanks for all the research you've done, highlighting the issues of the use of methane also in indoor air quality, as we saw at the beginning of the be of the year. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Marcelo, and thank you all for for attending. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for supporting work on methane and. Um, trying to improve the climate situation. Uh, as Marcella mentioned, I'm a faculty member at Stanford in the new uh, Door School of Sustainability and, and also um, deeply involved in the Global Carbon Project. And, and much of the work I'll present today uh, comes from that effort, which is an international group. Um, you can see my title today called the, the Meth Global Methane Cycle and Atmospheric Restoration. And I've added atmospheric restoration. It's important to me because I think methane presents a unique opportunity for us. It's the only major greenhouse gas for which we have the opportunity to reset the atmosphere, to restore the atmosphere to pre-industrial levels in the lifetime of people on this call. We can't do that for carbon dioxide because there's an extra trillion tons of carbon dioxide in the air right now, and it lasts too long to do that. But because of methane's um, lifetime of approximately a decade and its extreme potency, my goal and my hope, my dream, as I would say with all of you, would be to see methane restored to close to pre-industrial levels in my lifetime. So let me let me just set the stage today. That was my task to, to present a handful of background slides on on the methane cycle globally. And, and forgive me if you know all of this already, uh, but I think you all know that methane concentrations are rising 
I would I would say dangerously quickly in the atmosphere. In fact, the last two years, 2020 and 2021, both set records for the for the amount of increase over the last four decades. So the methane cycle is not only more um, has been more perturbed than the cycles of carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide in terms of the relative increase in the atmosphere, but the pace of increase is also speeding up dangerously, and it's quite concerning to all of us um, working in this field. So either the sources are going up, we're emitting more to the atmosphere, or the sinks are slowing down the natural detergents scrubbing methane from the atmosphere, like right? chlorine and OH radicals or soil microbes, or perhaps both. So next slide, please, Gabby. Well, why methane? I think everyone on this call understands why. It's it's short-lived, a uh, decade, 10, 12 years in the atmosphere. It's also responsible for almost two thirds as much warming as carbon dioxide. And forgive the busy figure in the middle, the only two bars to look at are the two red bars on the left. Um, the largest one is carbon dioxide. The next largest is methane. And over the decade of the 2010s, uh, carbon dioxide was responsible for about three quarters of a degree C warming compared to the late 19th century. But methane was responsible for half a degree warming over that same uh, period of comparison. So it's not quite as much as carbon dioxide, but it's a lot. And um, and our actions have the have the potential to change methane much more quickly than we do for CO2. But as I loved uh, Marcelo's analogy of sprints and marathon, we must do both, address both gases. So why methane also? Um, it's, it's responsible for a lot of warming. It's 25 to 85 times more potent than carbon dioxide over decades to centuries. Uh, a grad student in my lab, Sam Abernathy, just published a paper uh, this year looking at the timeframes for 1.5 C stabilization. And we argue based on the, the atmospheric physics and the climate uh, scenarios that the value for methane should be 75 times more than, than for carbon dioxide if, if 1.5 C is the goal. So the, the point is that methane is a potent gas um, and, and we have an opportunity. It presents a unique opportunity to affect temperatures in the near term. Next slide, please. And this, this one kind of illustrates similar things. Methane is one of our only levers to shave peak global temperatures and also to avoid or to delay critical temperature thresholds. Um, there are two figures here. Uh, the one on the left is a, uh, a graph showing the, the amount of temperature reduction in degrees C for every billion tons of methane that's either mitigated or removed from the atmosphere. And the right shows the benefit for ozone reductions of methane mitigation. And the, the point of these figures isn't the difference between the red and the purple lines, it's just how much above zero those are. The red and the purple lines represent uh, more aggressive and less aggressive mitigation scenarios. But the point is for every billion tons we keep from going into the atmosphere of methane or remove, We'll, we'll reduce global surface temperatures by 0.2 degrees C, and we'll, we'll, and we'll reduce global uh, surface ozone concentrations by one part per billion. And that one part per billion may not sound like very much, but it uh, will increase crop yield and will save an estimated 50,000 lives a year globally. And it's the kind of link between climate and health that people like Marcelo have been pushing for many years now. So reducing methane will, will shave temperatures substantially and improve air quality and, and improve human health. Next slide, please. Just one or two final slides on where methane comes from. Uh, this is a, a global methane budget figure from Mariel Sonwa in particular. The orange arrows on the left are sources of methane to the atmosphere from human activities. Energy is the 100 or so million tons on the far left. Agriculture is twice that big, more than 200 million tons a year, primarily from cattle and other ruminants, and to some extent manures and wastes, and rice paddies as well. Then we have some other sources. Then we have some other sources a little less under human control. Uh, biomass fires um, are a combination of human and um, and natural because some fires are set by people and some occur naturally. We have a large natural source from wetlands, um, and we were concerned about this wetland source. It's not just the orange bars that may increase if warming increases, when warming increases temperatures, we expect emissions from, from natural sources in, in the Arctic and in tropical wetlands in particular to go up. So we're concerned about natural sources too. And then on the right, you see ways that, that methane is scrubbed from the atmosphere, primarily from detergents in the atmosphere, uh, chlorine and OH radicals, and to a lesser extent, the thin bar on the right, microbes. Every bar on this figure presents an opportunity for us to tackle some aspect of methane in the atmosphere or uh, 
uh, getting to the atmosphere. So we have to think about both sources and sinks in our activities. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's our last one. And finally, to get to introduce the other speakers, to get to a more actionable place, we need to think not about single arrows, but about point sources of emissions. And these are inventory-based pictures of wetlands, uh, fossil fuels or the energy sector, ag and waste in the lower left, and biomass and biofuels burning. So these show you where the largest sources of methane are on the planet. Um, this kind of figure doesn't identify the super emitters for us. So I'm really excited about the satellites that are coming online that will help us find the largest sources in the energy sector, but also for landfills and feedlots and other operations. So I'm really excited about, uh, about the changes that are happening. Next slide, please. I think that's it. I just want to thank you. Um, thank you for your attention. I had to, uh, I'll stop. Yeah, great. I had, a, I had a thank you slide that didn't pop up. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Rob, uh, um, uh, for, for this update. I thought it was uh, excellent uh, and also reinforces a lot of the rhetoric that we've been, that we've been looking at. Uh, just one second. Um, and yeah. And um, I'll just continue with with the with the program. I think there's a, a question though that we, you might want to uh, respond to right away, Rob, which is uh, clarifying this: um, how much uh, how much of the 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 temperature we could decrease by reducing a billion tons of of methane? I think it was 0 0.2, right uh, degrees uh, in the short term, right? Anyway, our yeah. our analysis suggests zero slightly more than 0 0.2 degrees C for every billion tons of. Methane. Okay, great, excellent. So we'll continue with, um, and, and so this, it is something that could be done and achieved in the short term, and this will be the make or break of 1.5 being overcome or not. I'd like to uh, pass it over to uh, Yang Yang Shu. He is, uh, he is a, a professor, uh, assistant professor at the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at Texas A&M University. His research uh, interests are broadly related to climate and air pollution. He received the 2019 Global Environmental uh, environmental Career uh, Change Early Career Award for the vital insights into major issues related to both the science of climate change and the mitigation of climate change. Um, and um, he will will, will will discuss about the impacts on health and, and climate. And um, for that, I'd like to give you the floor, Yang Yang. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Marcelo, and uh, thank you for having me in the panel. Uh, in my brief remark here, I would like to highlight the methane impact on public health and ecosystem through both the surface uh, physical climate as well as the air quality issues. Uh, I would uh, want to comment a few recent studies coming out of my group as well as my reading of the uh, recent literature as a way to justify that we're truly living in the time of climate emergency and uh, methane and other short-lived compounds play a critical role for uh, our uh, actions. I will start with the uh, future scenario, uh, which is one of the worst scenario with unmitigated climate change. And particularly for South Asia region, the air pollution issue will continue due to their uh, rapid industrialization for coming decades, as well as uh, the lack of clean air action. So we show in this modeling work that the heat waves and the haze will both increase in future decades in terms of frequency and duration. And more importantly, we want to highlight that the physical climate change, as well as the air quality issues can work together to produce a compound effect on health and ecosystems. So we show that if you look at the joint risk, when you count the number of days during the year, when both heat and haze occur simultaneously, their occurrence are uh, going up at a much, much larger fraction uh, relative to uh, the individual uh, type of extremes. For example, in terms of land fraction currently exposed to more than 60 days of uh, uh, extreme conditions, there are 35% uh, land uh, exposed to heat condition, but that will increase to 56%. And similar fractional increase will be seen for air quality. But if you look at the joint exposure, uh, there 
joint exposure is currently rare, only 2% of the land fraction will be exposed to a uh, long duration of heat and haze. But under this particular future scenario, the future land fraction uh, exposure will increase from 2% to 25%. So relatively, that's becoming a more severe issue uh, once we account for the health impact. If human or ecosystems are subject to the neural stressor of both heat and haze. Of course, this is a modeling work looking into the future and a very uh, uh, extreme scenario with uh, limited climate action. But we have seen things happening on the ground so far for now, uh, looking at the actual observation over China, we see the temperature, uh, in this case, wet bulb temperature accounting for the humidity effects on thermal comfort. They actually increase together with ozone, surface ozone in China over uh, major cities during the last decade. Well, the uh, positive news is that the PM appears to be decreasing over China in the past decade, and ozone will uh, uh, start to dominate the air quality issue. And we also look at the health impact of such a uh, heat and ozone extreme occurrence. Uh, this is large scale, uh, based on large scale health record collected uh, in the past few years. And it's clear that uh, both ozone temperature as well as other air pollution compounds will increase the risk of preterm birth. And uh, we see the sharp uh, decrease of uh, uh, gestational age uh, uh, as the temperature and ozone elevates to a higher level. So this is, again, I take this as a reason for concern for more research and action towards uh, understanding better the science of methane and other short-lived compounds, as well as the mitigation uh, actions, which Gabby will talk about in a few in a few moments. And based on my reading of the global methane assessment uh, published last year, methane uh, will lead to major uh, ozone increase at the surface and directly contributes to uh, premature death. And this number is the estimated premature death per million tons of methane. And of course, we know the current emission is hundreds of uh, million tons per year. So in my uh, next few minutes, I will move to the methane and ozone impacts on ecosystems, both the managed ecosystem as well as the unmanaged uh, natural system. Uh, again, based on global methane assessment, uh, the largest agricultural impact from methane will be on Brazil, India, China, and the US, leading to major crop loss for uh, a variety of uh, crop types. And based on my recent estimates, uh, collaborating with agricultural economists, the uh, uh, various crops yields over the US has been negatively affected by both surface ozone as well as physical climate. So this brings reinforce my message early on that both the air quality and the physical climate are jointly affecting our world. And uh, uh, in, in this case, we show all the negative numbers, meaning negative impacts leading to crop yield loss uh, uh, for a variety of them due to the elevated uh, atmospheric uh, ozone uh, condition. And we also show all those negative coefficients will be uh, further uh, accelerated due to the uh, drought condition and the heat increase over the US. So uh, the compounding effects have been observed, both for health as well as for uh, crop yield. So lastly, I want to 
mentioned a very recent study published uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, this to me raised a further concern that the uh, physical climate and uh, chemical consequences are not only joint, jointly affecting the ecosystems as well as human health, they can bring in interactions within. So based on their observational analysis, they're suggesting the global warming leads to drought and uh, surface warming, which can exacerbate uh, the risk of wildfires. In the case of more frequent wildfires, the uh, uh, carbon monoxide emission from fires will compete with uh, atmospheric oxygen, uh, such as OH, as uh, Professor Jackson mentioned, which is a critical methane chemical thing. And with the elevated risk of fires, uh, the OH level in the atmosphere will drop, and that actually prolongs the methane lifetime meaning uh, there is an inherent positive feedback uh, 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 involving methane and climate. So um, according to this new study, at least, I personally feel uh, the methane, the issue of methane will be uh, receiving more attention in future years. And now it's really the critical time to put our efforts into the science of the methane cycle, as well as the uh, mitigation space, as Gabby will comment uh, in the next session. So that's all my uh, remarks for today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, Yang Yang, for your for your um, for your presentation and and uh, all the work that you've been doing uh, in highlighting the the benefits uh, that we could achieve of reducing. Uh, methane, which is also very local. Uh, those who take action will receive direct benefits from lower air pollution exposure. Um, and um, these benefits many times uh, are underestimated and we need to expand looking at the reduced exposure to VOCs, indoor air quality issues, open burning, particulate matter uh, from ammonia that's co many times with methane, or just the benefits of adopting healthier diets, which we're also going to be substantive. Uh, it's also a great concern with the OH uh, impacts as a sink and what other what other emissions could impact, including hydrogen. You know, and, and, and extending the atmospheric life of these warming um, uh, uh, warming um, um, substances. So thanks for that, Yang Yang, and we'll continue then, um, and we'll, we'll have a further discussion in the panel. We'll continue with uh, Gabriel Dreyfus. Um, Gabriel, thanks so much for for helping uh, put it together this uh, this um, presentation. But of course, this starts from a from this conversation starts from your recent uh, proceedings of National Academy of Sciences uh, uh, report uh, highlighting the impact of the short term uh, benefits that we could uh, achieve from short lived climate pollutant focus on mitigation. Dr. Dreyfus is a Chief Scientist at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, IGSD. She's also adjunct faculty at Georgetown University and a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Fast Track Committee on Developing Framework for Evaluating Global Greenhouse Gas Emissions Information for Decision Making. Uh, she'll, um, she'll present mitigation in time, methane feedbacks and averting two climate crises. Thanks so much, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcelo, very much. I'm going to present some slides. Just a moment to bring those up. So as you've heard from Yang Yang and Rob already, uh, methane is a critical contributor to warming and to air pollution, health, and food security. And uh, so this here I want to highlight this linkage with the methane and the feedbacks that uh, Yang Yang just highlighted, this the fact that as we warm, we're actually potentially contributing to increases in that um, the methane concentrations and the timelines that we're talking about when we're talking about two climate crises, uh, we're used to talking about what the temperature will be in 2100 and trying to limit that below two degrees. But what you're hearing today is that we are also facing a climate emergency today. Some of the graphs that Yang Yang were showing are quite concerning in terms of the impacts we're already feeling in terms of heat, humidity, pollution, and on crop losses. So 
I am going to focus on four concepts that really uh, are key to understanding the impacts of emissions and mitigation strategies. So the first set of concepts is this concept of sources and pollutants that we have a habit of treating individual pollutants like CO2 or methane as if they're individual knobs that we can turn like in computer models. But when you actually consider mitigation strategies and their impact on emission sources, most sources emit multiple types of pollutants. In particular, coal burning fire plants are not only large sources of CO2, but they're also the primary sources of sulfates, which are reflective particles that are currently masking about half a degree Celsius of warming. And so as we pursue, as we must, a fossil fuel phase out consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 C, what you see in this figure here from Shindell and Smith from 2019 is that when you put together from the same sources, the CO2 and the SO2, so set the sulfates that are reflecting, when you turn off those coal plants to reduce the CO2, you also reduce those sulfates and they fall out of the atmosphere in days to weeks. And that means that we actually expect to see a small but real increase in warming in the near term as we pursue fossil fuel phase out as those sulfates fall out of the atmosphere. And so to compensate and offset that near-term warming, because that warming is so dangerous for our health and our climate and safeguarding uh, our, our ability to adapt as we'll hear next, um, we need to focus both on the fossil fuel phase out, reducing CO2, and on these short-lived climate pollutants with methane being an extremely potent uh, target. So this graph, we have this re representation where the reductions from the global methane assessment, a 45% reduction below BAU in 2030, gets you about 0.3 degrees of avoided warming. In comparison, a fossil fuel phase out gets you about 0.1 of avoided warming by 2050. And I do want to acknowledge that blue line, that methane line, about 30% of that is fossil fuel related, but that means that the vast majority needs targeted mitigation measures. And this is important now to our second set of concepts. So we were just talking about sources and pollutants. So methane emissions generally are not correlated with the SO2, so you don't get that unmasking effect. So the other set of concepts, so we have sources and, and pollutants. The other set of concepts that are really important is the concept of time and temperature. We need to be thinking about when is the warming happening and what does that mean for risk? So uh, this graphic here from the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change, their working group to the adaptation and vulnerability report shows temperature projections in the left and the right panel shows these risks and impacts across five different categories of concern. And you can see in the gray horizontal bar where we are right now, about 1.1 degrees above, um, above pre-industrial and the red dotted line is that 1.5 guardrail. And that 1.5 C guardrail, we're already starting to get into some red orange uh, reasons for concern in extreme weather. We're already experiencing that and also the loss of unique and threatened ecosystems. But the bar on the right, these, these abrupt changes, these are these tipping points in the climate system that can be abrupt and uh, often are irreversible. So this is why it's so important to keep us below 1.5, not just in 2100, but in 2050. And that's why we need a slow warming now. And that's why methane is so important. As we saw before, that it's, it's, it's one of the few levers we have to slow warming in the next decades. And the reason that last abrupt climate change uh, issue is a concern is that we know that there are feedbacks and tipping points in the system. And most climate models don't have the process-based um, uh, physics and the coupling. This is this concept of cascading tipping points. I just saw a preprint for a paper that was uh, presented by Wunderling uh, at the European Geophysical Union meeting this spring, where they're just starting to quantify how much risk is um, for uh, triggering a cascade of impacts is linked to this overshoot concept. So we're very likely 
going to approach 1.5, maybe overshoot 1.5 by the early 2030s. And so again, we need a slow warming now, not just in 2100 to limit these risks. This is a previous paper that showed the interconnection of these feedback and tipping points, starting in the, the Arctic is extremely vulnerable. Um, not only uh, are we losing the reflective ice there that can drive essentially uh, accelerated loss of Greenland ice, which can destabilize ocean circulation, which can destabilize the Amazon and the Sahara and the West Antarctic ice sheet and leading to sea level rise. Um, there are all these features uh, that are connected. And of course, in the Arctic, we also have permafrost, which is a massive reservoir of CO2, methane, and N2O. So this is, again, why we need to slow warming in the near term. So the paper Marcelo mentioned, uh, I'd like to acknowledge, we have Yang Yang on and Derwood and, and Ramanathan, who are co-authors of this paper. Uh, Drew unfortunately couldn't make it today. Um, this paper really uh, lays out a, a really important distinction, which is that just focusing on fossil fuel phase out to CO2 is insufficient to keep warming below even that two degree threshold. And so we need to do this dual strategy, uh, this, uh, this combination of a sprint and a marathon to slow warming in the near term and to, to stay in the game, essentially stay in the race long enough to decarbonize our energy systems and uh, stay within a safe climate. So that's, um, that's what I have to bring today. And um, with that, I'll turn it back uh, to Marcelo. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I, I appreciate the, the, the great coverage that you did uh, of, of, of your paper. And of course, yeah, and I, I like the fact that you don't, um, you know, like a lot of people get, get, uh, get, get sort of bogged down on detail with the cooling effect. We need to reduce cooling aerosol regardless you can't tell communities that you know they're not going to reduce you know warming uh sorry cooling uh cooling uh, aerosol because that kills people because it might change the balance of you know we need to reduce both and we need to consider the fact that we're going to have to reduce both at once uh so we'll have uh, we have uh time for some questions now um we've been you guys have been great in terms of uh, keeping it to your the time time slot that we had uh, considered. Uh, we have a lot on the Q and A. I would like to remind you to 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 put your uh, most to, to your questions on the Q and A. But I'll I'll start off uh, with a question for uh, for Rob. If he's is around. Um, uh, methane concentrations are increasing. You know, at an alarming rate, much faster than CO two. Uh, how much is due to human activity directly, and how much is due to uh, warming accelerating natural feedbacks? And how well do we understand those feedbacks? That map, you know, that uh, some people show of methane, uh, sometimes do show these wetland locations that we have to be concerned about. And you know, maybe it's not all natural. You know, if you have a whole bunch of wetlands that are receiving wastewater, I'm not sure it's fully natural, right? But uh, Rob, how much is natural versus uh, not natural? How how do we understand those feedbacks? Well, I have to say that it's somewhat embarrassing, Marcel, that I don't think I can answer that question fully. And I'll just I'll just expand upon it briefly. Um, I, I think I think we do have a pretty good sense that most of the increase is coming from anthropogenic sources, but there are some some sectors that, were, that are hard to tell apart. And the the hardest is, for instance, the uh, the potential for tropical wetlands um, to be emitting more methane, and we expect that to happen as temperatures warm because you're sort of uh, supercharging the microbes and activity goes up. Uh, we don't see any evidence for runaway release in the Arctic, and we have a pretty good sense of that because of the latitudinal gradient in methane. So I would say runaway Arctic methane release is a real danger, as Gabby pointed out, but is not happening yet, as best we can tell. It is happening in particular places, but does not seem to be happening regionally or globally. So I would say the consensus would be mostly human um, split between energy and, and agricultural emissions, and some ambiguity about what's happening in the tropics. I'm, I'm concerned about um, increased natural sources because those are very hard to put back in the bottle once they start, if and, if and when they start. Oh, thanks so much. And um, Yang Yang, I, I wanted to ask you all, you know, the, what are the risks if we don't make deep cuts in methane emissions this decade? Uh, we were already facing the most expensive food prices ever. If agricultural productivity, for example, is going to be hit, it's going to only hurt uh, those who uh, are most vulnerable. What, what, what's at risk if we don't take action now? 
Yeah, from my presentation, I made the case that methane contributes to near-term warming and uh, direct air quality issues that put uh, negative impacts to food systems and human health. Uh, but to answer your question, I want to echo what Gabby presented, uh, which is very clear that without mitigating methane and other short-lived compounds, we will have near to zero chance of meeting the 1.5 degree goal. Uh, obviously, I, I don't think anything magic will happen after we cross that threshold, but every tenth of degree moving beyond that, we'll have a higher chance of triggering other nonlinear feedback in the system and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, putting our society uh, into the risk of tipping points, which are largely unknown, and therefore it's uh, uh, very concerning. Mm. So that's my take on uh, your question, that we have to work hard to reduce methane emission right now, so we will have some chance to reduce the near-term warming rate, uh, as well as lower the uh, probability of hitting those tipping points down the road. Great. Uh, and um, Gabrielle, I just wanted to ask you a little bit of a pedagogic question, because a lot we hear sometimes, you know, almost a third of the warming has come from methane uh, or some say half or, you know, a quarter. Uh, we hear different numbers on the contribution to recent warming. Uh, and obviously future warming also has another story. Can you help us explain the differences between those numbers, between the contribution between a, a fourth or a half of the warming that we've uh experience up to now. Yeah, I'm glad that Rob showed that picture of the graph um, from the IPCC report because it comes down to, uh, again, we talk about sources and pollutions. Um, the a lot of um, the, 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 the one third 25% is only the greenhouse gases. It's looking at the radio forcing only of greenhouse gases and it ignores the effect of aerosols, both warming and cooling aerosols. And so when you look at the figure, when you convert the contribution to temperature, we're currently at 1.1 degree warming because we actually have more heat in the system, but about half a degree of that is being masked. So the half number comes from when you look at the fact that there's 0.5 degrees of warming is due to methane. And most methane sources aren't associated with those reflected aerosols. But um, this is actually where I think the community uh, may want to uh, find a way to be more consistent. I think it's important not to ignore those aerosols and um, and that essentially that 25% dramatically uh, under represents the contribution of, of methane. Uh, and it's uh, there's also a distinction, this is getting really into the details between concentration-based and emission-based contribution. And that figure I showed you is the emission based. Because if you remember, methane only lasts in the atmosphere about 12 years. And so if you look at the, the concentration change and only use that to calculate the radiative forcing, you're missing the ozone and other effects that that methane, when it breaks down the atmosphere, has on radiative forcing. Ozone itself is a strong uh, greenhouse gas for um, a, radi a warming pollutant. And so you'll see sometimes in Twitter and elsewhere these figures where they're, con they're calculating from methane concentration its contribution to warming. And that absolutely underestimates the, the contribution to that. But I do want to ask Rob if he, he has some thoughts on this, because I know that you, you spend a lot of time thinking about this as well. So which aspect, Gabby, the sort of aerosol component or the, um, I'm not sure what you mean. Yeah, if, if what when you talk about methane's contribution to warming, what what numbers do you use, and how do you explain it? I guess I tend well. Uh, first of all, your point is well taken about um, you know just the greenhouse gases. That is the currency that's used most often. I I I if I compare methane, I would compare it directly, say, to carbon dioxide, where it's sort of two thirds two thirds of the direct warming from the gases, which doesn't which sort of skips over the interactions, um, the aerosols and other, other pollutants. And, um, and you know, depending on what analysis you use does or does not include the ozone and other interactions that you've mentioned that we know are, are real, they're part of the part of the climate system. So 
So I tend to, um, I guess, compare greenhouse gases, uh, the warming to the, to, uh, you know, the others in the IPCC framework, I suppose. Yeah, so um, I have a, a question. Well, there's many questions that you guys have already answered in the Q&A section, but there's one that I want to expand a little bit about. Um, when we look at uh, what we should be doing in mitigating methane, we see many opportunities in the energy sector, which we will see later on that are under underutilized. It's an opportunity that we're missing out on. But there's also uh, um, measures that we have not developed in terms of the, the technically feasible mitigation of other sectors, including uh, agriculture and others. Uh, the question uh, from Monica, um, no, for, sorry, from, um, from Anonymous would be, uh, you know, uh, you, generally to, to Rob, but also to the rest of the panel, you spoke briefly on the restoration of safe methane levels in the atmosphere and touched on the removal, how much we should be looking into R&D and methane removal and more, more broadly in terms of methane mitigation. Uh, do we have all the solutions we need uh, to really deploy or are there things that we still have not broken uh, through into reductions? In general, we can start with Rob and then overall, what are the opportunities that we still need to be exploring and expanding mitigation options? I'll, I'll be brief because I, I did put an answer in the chat. I, I do think research on methane removal is important because, um, because ultimately we're, I think we're gonna need it. There will be hard to, hard to eliminate sources of methane, the diffuse sources that Monica has been highlighting in the chat, um, agricultural, wetland-based sources, I think will, will be very hard to uh, to get to zero. So I think ultimately we're going to need some some methane removal and and honestly getting to zero in the energy sector will be hard. Um, but I think the, the methane removal as a goal is important, but we don't need to start with two ppm in the atmosphere. We actually don't have a technology today for, for removing or oxidizing methane below about 2000 parts per million where uh, thermal oxidizers work. So there's a mitigation technology gap that we could address first. And then I hope through R&D, we can work our way down to two parts per million in the in the bulk atmosphere, but we don't need to start with the with the bulk atmosphere. And um, uh, just kudos to uh, Monica's comment about these diffuse sources. These are hard. There's a comment about uh, ruminants. I you know I I, I like the work at, at, in Australia. Davis people like Hermes Cabreb and Frank Middelhofer looking at feed additives. I think that works really important. I think the challenge isn't so much the additive; it's how you get that additive to one and a half billion cows around the earth and how you scale it. But I think that's enough for me. I'll turn it over to uh, Gabrielle and Yang Yang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so any other uh, other uh, yeah conversations regarding these things? And I, I also like I'll make the, the case of, you know, I've been, I'm an avid cyclist, right? But every time I see a report on the things that we should be doing uh, to mitigate uh, CO2, bikes aren't really <laughs> considered to be a serious uh, solution. And many times uh, I feel that some of the measures that we are considering for um, for uh, for uh, the, the mitigation of methane and sectors of the food system, for example, are sometimes have sort of this technological bias that will will we'll solve it through that and not necessarily through something as basic as eating healthier. I don't know what you guys think about, like, how do we really cut across and have more options? If you look at the OCO paper, only 2% of, of measures in the agricultural sector, which we know we need to reduce, uh, are, are cost effective at this point. But that's very much in the a, in a technological uh, vision of these things and not necessarily on just being better, uh, but more efficient in the way that we eat. Um, have any other comments so, regarding the R&D agenda? So, so Marcella, on that point, though, um, not a technological fix about, I think, just shy of 30% of human-related methane emissions are from essentially decomposing wasted food and other organics. So this is the landfill. There's also wastewater. So I know California and a few other jurisdictions have gotten really good at diverting that organic waste from landfills where it will decompose without oxygen and make methane. And if it's not captured, it goes into the atmosphere. And so we just saw with a heat wave that occurred in Delhi last month, they had multiple landfills on fire because of all that methane and that extreme heat. So this is, I think, a low tech uh, solution is to get back to essentially, well, reducing uh, food waste and diverting it to um, 
uh, a compost, but also uh, upstream on the food, there's a food loss component as well that we should be reducing. If we, when we talk about food, the food security issues, there's a real opportunity also to put in place um, better cold chains and other systems to reduce food loss, which is another source of methane from the agricultural sector. Yeah, most definitely there's a great opportunity. And, and I think a lot of the things that we should be doing is bulking together the food system, including the waste as an extension of a food system that's inefficient that loses 30% of its production in the face of the highest food prices we've ha had historically, right? And so therefore, uh, in the context, of course, that landing landfilling nutrients uh, instead of uh, and having fossil fuel derived fertilizers that have uh, contributed to the rise in food prices. So yes, I hope this agenda also helps us contribute to a more sustainable uh, food system. Um, Yes. So Maybe just briefly, Marcel, I think you know, we're used to thinking about de demand side management for electricity and we did, we need to talk about or acknowledge demand side management for, for beef and dietary choices, as you said, as well, because that's could be a big part of, of getting to 1.5. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I have a question from, uh, from Eric Gibbs. Uh, how consequential is the uh, European Commission's decision to include methane gas as a low carbon fuel in the EU, EU taxonomy uh, in, in, in comparison to the global methane pledge and overall methane emissions given a significant uh, a potential sig signaling effect to the rest of the world? I think a lot of people are really concerned about what happened, even though the vote wasn't as clear cut as it was expected at the beginning of the year. What are your uh, takes on the signal that we're providing in the context of a, of a war on, on, on fuels and, and what we can say to the world about how sustainable natural gas will be to this transition? So I think that's a great topic actually for our next panel that's gonna get into more of the mitigation and policy side. Uh, so I don't know if you wanna hold that off or tell her, if you want us to take a gander, but I feel like that, that could be, that one's probably gonna get a stronger answer from our next panel. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But then here's a science one uh, to geek out on, which is from Hayden. If you had to trade off methane and CO2 and uh, on of an equivalent radiative forcing, which gas would you advocate emitting and how much would you ab advocate reducing? And uh, Hayden also has, who is our uh, ag uh, program director, always has a concern regarding, you know, the unintended consequences, reducing methane and, and, and in increasing longer lived species like nitrous oxide. So um, the question for whoever wants to take it. So if we, if we don't survive the next several decades, then the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere in 2100 for me is less important. So do you wanna die, do you wanna die now or die later? So I actually think that trade-off question is not the way we should be thinking about this. And I think it's unfortunate uh, and I'm on this National Academies Committee with, Pete, with uh, Don Webels, who is one of the people who created this concept of global warming potential, which essentially forces you to into this trade-off mentality where you have to adopt a time scale, which is really a values choice. How much do you value the next 20 years versus the next 100 years? And it doesn't actually tell you what you need to know about the temperature trajectory and what that means for the ability of civilization to adapt and survive. So I'm actually going to say it depends on your application, uh, but we need to do both. And trading off actually is uh, in this zero sum way of thinking does not actually help us achieve what we're trying to achieve, which is maintaining a livable planet. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yes, may, I just, may I add just briefly, Marcelo? Um, I, I would say that here there is it's a great question, and I honestly, I don't. I'm not sure I know the answer, but this is a case where advocating, thinking about multiple gases together might send us in a different direction. When we think about cattle, cattle production is the biggest, one of the biggest sources of methane in the world. It also has effects on the carbon cycle through deforestation, particularly in the tropics. But in the energy sector in particular, I think we have the opportunity to reduce both carbon dioxide and methane emissions together by going to renewables and, and cleaner fuels. So I, I would advocate, I would never want to have to make that choice. If, if I had to make it, I would say go with methane just to have a chance to, to keep the world within safe levels, but we can't do it on methane alone. So, so look for opportunities to, to reduce both and energy and, and beef uh, through methane and deforestation are both examples of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and just a, a final comment on that also in, in the context of 
10 years ago when the climate and clean air coalition was launched a lot of the people were saying you know maybe this is a play to delay action on co2 and not focus on what is at hand but really the high the, the information that's been provided by satellites uh, in, including the leaking, have really reinforced the fact that this are reinforcing agendas that really signal that we should phase out fossil fuels faster. The work that you've done, uh, Rob, also highlights this. There's a immediate exposure that we have to pollutants indoors uh, because we are using these dirtier fuels and the evidence towards electrification is stronger. Um, yes. So, yeah, I think we did a uh, good time. Uh, good time there. Um, um, I think in, in terms of timing, there's other questions that you might want to answer uh, uh, online also regarding you know food supplements and all the cool things that are happening on. You know, I think we're actually the private sector in many ways is moving faster than the regulators. You have multiple uh, multiple uh, dairy and meat producers in the U.S. moving on methane inhibitors faster than the regulators are able to approve uh, these uh, these uses for for those purposes. So I think uh, things are exciting and the commercial advantages that uh, are really being also seized upon. So we went through the science and I wanted to thank you uh, all, Gabriel, uh, Rob, uh, Yang Yang for, for, for your time. And we're gonna continue with the next uh, panel. So right off the bat, we'll continue um, with the second panel of speakers highlighting uh, the role of methane in addressing the climate crisis in terms of mitigation. I think adaptation is an angle that we also under uh, underutilize uh, resilience and finance. And we'll begin with Professor Ram Ramanathan. Uh, Professor Ramanathan is a presidential chair uh, of uh, Emeritus Presidential Chair in Climate Sustainability at University of California in San Diego and a 2030 Climate Solutions Scholar at Cornell University. He is a pioneer in climate science known uh, for fundamental research in Earth's radiation budget, including his discovery in 1975 of the extremely potent uh, greenhouse effect of chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, he is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and, re and received the Blue Planet Prize for his work in short-lived climate pollutants. I've also interacted uh, with uh, Ram um, when we were at the, um, at the Vatican on this, uh, this uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences seminar on climate and health, which I think was very important. And of course, I cannot help mention that he wrote the seminal paper on black carbon contribution to radiative forcing with my former advisor, uh, Greg Carmichael at the University of Iowa. So um, Ram, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a presentation uh, right now uh, regarding the, the methane mitigation uh, to being crucial to climate resilience. So Ram, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, thanks for pointing out our paths have crossed uh, in the past. Gabby, would you be able to show my uh, PowerPoint presentation? Thank you. <clears throat> yes. I want to give a set the stage in terms of the urgency of the climate change issue and point out where methane fits in. Uh, this is a paper Yang Yang uh, Shu, myself, uh, and another scientist, David Victor, we published in 2018, where we just used the IPCC data and models to uh, make a, a sort of a forecast that we will cross the one and a half degree warming by year 2030. That's just about eight years from now. IPCC at that time was still thinking it will be 2040s. Now they have revised it in the recent report. Now they say it's early 2030s. I want to start off with that simply because I still hear many suggesting we should try to keep the warming under one and a half or at one and a half, which I would say is impossible. Why? Simply because look at the inertia in the system for you know, our CO2 emissions peaked last year. It went down in 2020 and came screaming back. So there is inertia in the political system there is inertia in scaling up technologies, renewable technologies. There is inertia in going from emissions 
the reduction in the concentration, and there is inertia in the climate system. Each of these have time scales of 5, 10, 15 years. So at least in the work I've done, there is nothing we can do to stop that crossing of one and a half degrees. Say geoengineering, I'm not going to talk about that now. So we should not be thinking about, oh, let's keep the warming below one and a half. We should now start thinking about how are we going to protect the people when it crosses this one and a half degree dangerous warming. So why do I call it dangerous? The planet crossed the degree warming during the decade of 2010 to 2020. My own work with Yang Yang suggests he crossed it around 2014. What was the outcome? The hot temperature extremes frequency increased 180%. Heavy precipitation frequency increased 30%. Agricultural droughts in drying regions increased 70%, all with one degree warming. About 606,000 lives were lost to weather extremes and 4.1 billion people were displaced. This is a 20 year accumulated figure. Just to cap it all up, the disaster numbers increased by a factor of five from 1970 to now when most of the one degree warming happened. So we should uh, assume that this one and a half degree warming is, 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 will be in our rear view mirror by 2030. If you take that approach, if I can go to the next slide, Gabby, thank you. We, our climate plans should now think about resilience, okay? We have to be honest, we have to be frank and admit some dangerous warming is gonna happen, not decades from now, just 10 years from now. So our plan should be thinking three dimensions. First is mitigation. We got to mitigate to reduce the risks. Otherwise the risks would become unmanageable. But we need to put adaptation on the same front page as mitigation. Billions are going to suffer. And we need to think about how do we, I'll give you an example of that soon. And transformation, we know you're not going to be able to do the mitigation adaptation without, without transformative changes in the socio-economic system, transformative changes in the ecosystem through natural climate solutions. So let me just come to the risk issue. How much can we reduce the risk? And what is the risk? So the planet has warmed by 1.1 degree as of two, uh, 2021. It's warming at the rate of about 0.35 degrees centigrade, between 0.3 to 0.4 per decade. This is based on the paper uh, <clears throat> uh, I wrote with Gabby and Yang Yang and Durban and others. IPCC has the same number. What does that mean? 0.3 to 0.4 degree per decade with unchecked emissions it's just simple algebra. The warming will go from one and a half to 2.1, 2 point. It will shoot past two degrees by 2050. So that is what we are trying to mitigate. Keep the warming under two degrees. I think it's a fallacy to say, keep the warming at one and a half, but that's one and a half is a done deal. So that is where this paper we did comes into the picture. Even if you decarbonize to near zero emissions by 2050, we showed in this paper cutting methane emissions would cut down the warming three times as much as from the decarbonization. Why is that? Simply because when we cut fossil fuel down to decarbonize, we're also unmasking the aerosol effects. Think of the greenhouse gases as a blanket and aerosols are mirrors on the blanket. So when you burn fossil fuel, you're thickening the blanket, but you're also putting mirrors on the blanket, which is reflecting sunlight. So all of that comes into play. But of course, if you think beyond 2050, the only way to stop the dangerous warming is cutting CO2. 
But see, since CO2 has huge lifetime, we got to do the CO2 reduction today to have the benefit of the cooling of by 2050 and beyond. So we simply lost the luxury to talk about climate change as a decarbonization problem, or climate change as a methane problem. It's all of them, and we got to cut all of them down. The third component of resilience, building resilience, is transformation. And I'm not going to get into it. And we all know instinctively that it's going to require a massive societal transformation, socioeconomic transformation, technological transformation, and educating the people. All of that is required to make this happen, mitigation adaptation. Let me talk to you about the urgency of the problem. If I can have the next slide, please. So we're all sitting in our comfortable offices. I'm sitting in my comfortable home in close to San Diego, California. If there is a huge heat wave, I'm just going to increase the air conditioning. If there are fires, of course, I have the facility to leave my house or take insurance to protect themselves. But there are 3 billion people in the world who have none of that. And uh, this is a woman in a Himalayan village. I was her guest. I did a sabbatical traveling over villages in India. This was just four years or five years ago. She is still cooking her food with uh, 18th century technologies. And you may think, oh, it's just one woman in Himalayas. No, 3 billion people are still relying on these primitive technologies a heat wave, a flood, a fires, would just wipe her livelihood out. So for her, it is a big deal if we can reduce the 2050 warming instead of 2.1, 2.2 to about 1.7. Half a degree would mean life and death for her. In that half a degree, 70% of that comes from methane reduction. So there is a lot of talk about justice, inequality, and all that. Methane reductions, I would also add black carbon and HFCs, all of them, why there are technologies available. See, when that flame emits about 60% of the black carbon, that flame and all the pollutants kill about 3 million women and children like her. She had a two-year-old baby she gave it to uh, uh, my student who was with me. But normally she'd hold that child on her hip and she cooks. So that's what we are talking about, that we have lost the luxury to talk about the climate problem as a mitigation problem. We have to bring in resilience. And we need to think about how are we going to build that resilience for this poorest 3 billion. When you start the problem that way, we, we won't even be sitting justifying methane emissions. We'd have done it decades ago. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ram. That was excellent. And also it reminds us uh, how the big challenges that we also have on issues on energy poverty. And, and sometimes, you know, the global north focus uh, doesn't really highlight the fact that around um, you know in in, develop, in low income countries uh, access to clean energy is among the lowest globally and and the the real way to get uh, action from developing countries to show the local benefits that could be achieved with uh, with a with a system that actually uh, allows us to hit all the marks we want gender equality uh, clean access to clean energy. Uh, just better quality of life, livable cities, and also using the latest um, uh, adoption of the WHO health standards to highlight the fact that there is no, there are no low thresholds. Particular matter does not uh, impact health negatively. So thanks for for your presentation. Of course, then the link to adaptation. Of course, uh, that we, this is going to be uh, an opportunity that we could also achieve in the agricultural sector. Um, it, with better practices uh, as we improve efficiency in the production, but also the fact that lowering methane will reduce temperature and that will have multiple benefits to climate. So we're going to continue uh, with Barbara uh, Buckner from 
uh, the Climate Policy Initiative. Um, Barbara, uh, you 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 just put out a report that was uh, has some great findings. But I'll just introduce you before that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ramanathan. Dr. Buckner is a uh, global managing director for the Climate Policy Initiative, where she directs the global innovation for. Lab for Climate Finance and advises leaders on climate, energy, and land use investments around the world. She was named one of the 20 most influential women in climate change and one of the uh, one out of the 100 uh, most influential people in climate policy. Um, I used her reports many years, and it was been a pleasure to collaborate just uh, recently on this first uh, report on methane finance. And the res the results show, you know, there's a great opportunity where there's may, many opportunities missed at this point. So Barbara, uh, could you tell us a little bit about that report? Uh, the floor is yours. Absolutely, and thank you so much, Marcelo. It's a true pleasure to be here today with you to discuss this, uh, the critical methane abatement finance gap. But I also wanna say, I think it's very important to, to kind of cast the net a little bit wider and think about the nexus between adaptation, mitigation and everything else. And yes, just as uh, some of the background, because again, we are rather new in the methane uh, discussion, but for over 10 years, my organization, which is Climate Policy Initiative, we have helped governments, businesses and financial institutions to really drive economic growth while addressing climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. And uh, we are known for our work in, in tracking sustainable investment trends, uh, but also in identifying innovative business models and supporting the solutions that can drive a, a just transition to a low carbon climate resilient economy. And as we all know, and as we've heard very eloquently from uh, the distinguished first panel, but also from my previous uh, co-panelist on the second one, I think climate science tells us very clearly that we need to decarbonize the global economy by mid-century at the latest to avoid the worst climate impacts. And I would actually go further than my previous um, speaker to also say that adaptation is already needed today and the impacts of climate change are already visible. So I think we need to really scale up even more uh, adaptation um, uh, activities. And I think some of that is happening just um, in, in terms of uh, the focus that we have on finance, which we see as a key lever for climate action across mitigation and adaptation. Our latest climate finance overarching tracking report shows that annual financial flows aimed at climate action reached little more than 630 billion US dollars on average. And we've seen that public and private actors have been steadily increasing their climate investments in the last decade, which is obviously good news, but we also saw that uh, flows largely plateaued in the last four years. And more broadly, um, financial flows are nowhere near the estimated needs. And this brings me to the topic that we are here today to discuss methane. I think sharpened rapid reductions in methane emissions this at this decade are really essential to limit global warming to below two degrees. I would still keep it at uh, the goal at 1.5 degrees Celsius, not because science um, isn't um, the one to follow. And I think I, I also agree again with my previous panelists here, but I do think we are also working in a, in a, work of, uh, in a world of, of policymakers and uh, where lots of negotiations are happening. So I think, you know, keeping uh, the, the goal um, as ambitious as possible will help us to do really the very best that we need in order to address the climate issue. And I think what we've um, very clearly heard already in this um, webinar today is that reducing human cost methane emissions by um, a large number. And I think the numbers we've seen by 30% this decade from 2020 levels as set out uh, in the global methane pledge would avert at least uh, 0.2 degrees Celsius in global warming by 2050. And this is why today um, uh, CPI Vista support from the global methane hub have uh, published the landscape of methane abatement finance which really is a first of its kind report on methane mitigation finance, aiming to assess the global investment in methane abatement activities, but also aiming to create the baseline against which investment needs and progress can be measured. So our study focuses on existing and established abatement solutions in three broad sectors, um, in fossil fuels, uh, in waste uh, and wastewater, and in agriculture. And together, these sectors account for about 95% of human-made methane emissions. Um, as you already said, um, Marcella, our findings are stark. I think despite the methane's outside contribution to global climate change, finance for methane emissions abatement only accounts for less than 
2% of global uh, climate finance or just over 10 billion US dollars annual average in 2019 and 2020. And this means that a tenfold increase in methane abatement finance is necessary to meet the estimated more than 120 billion US dollars needed from both public and private sources annually. Let me just very briefly share our three key findings. First one, uh, and I think that's already clear from, from how I started, and uh, this uh, overview here is that methane abatement solutions are severely underfunded considering their climate change mitigation potential, uh, while other also other funded, underfunded other climate change solutions with similar mitigation potential, such as uh, low carbon transport, and received um, uh, 15 times the investment of methane abatement measures. Uh, other solutions such as low solar and wind uh, received 26 times uh, the investment of methane abatement solutions. So you really can see that there is a fundamental gap and really an underfunding that is happening. The first key finding that I wanted to share is really understanding where the current finance is coming from. So in terms of sources, the private sector, and I think you said that also already before, Marcella, the private sector accounted for the majority of tracked financial flows, particularly more mature segments, such as waste to energy technologies, where commercial viability at scale is well established. And within the public sector, we've seen that development finance institutions were a key source of financing. They accounted for about 13 percent of all methane abatement flows. So just a third, where does the finance end up at the moment? I think what we see is that regionally, most methane emissions originate in East Asia and Pacific, um, that most of the methane abatement finance in 2019 and 2020 was actually concentrated there, which obviously is a, is a good trend. But what you also see is that significant abatement potential exists in other regions, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa, which are respectively the second and the third largest methane emitters, which combined uh, attracted only about 6% of methane abatement finance. I think overall our findings show that the limited existing investment flows are not being directed to the sectors of highest abatement potential. And let me just make an example here. Um, we, we know that dramatic reductions in methane from the fossil fuel sector are critical to maintaining uh, a 1.5 or 2 degree aligned pathway. And despite having that greatest mitigation potential by 2030, tracked investment to cut methane emissions from this sector is less than 0.5% uh, of methane abatement finance. So it's falling well below the investment needs um, at uh, which we at the moment are seeing uh, around 30 billion US dollars annually uh, up to 2015. I think we also have uh, heard um, that the mitigation potential in this sector is large with the International Energy Agency estimating that it's technically possible to avoid 75% of methane emissions from the oil and gas subsector with a significant portion of these avoided at no net cost, especially with today's uh, high gas prices. So how can we make progress? Um, I think what we uh, recommend uh, based on our um, work is that all three sectors should be addressed simultaneously. So to ensure uh, key stakeholders adequately invest in methane mitigation, uh, we see a very strong need for public actors to cultivate a strong enabling environment for methane mitigation project, both by providing enhanced regulatory signals and also binding policy that are tailored to key sectors and specify also minimum standards and penalties for methane emissions. They should both incentivize the uptake of established technologies and direct spending towards research and development in emerging solutions such as cutting edge um, enteric um, emissions from livestock. And at the same time, private sector financial and corporate actors should incorporate ambitious and rapidly escalating methane reduction targets in their interim net zero goals. And they should also uh, monitor um, both the scope one, the scope two and the scope three methane emissions and improve transparency on methane related capital expenditures, in addition to rapidly deploying existing methane abatement solutions and providing catalytic finance to support to um, uh, a more innovative uh, methane abatement solutions. So just uh, to conclude, uh, again, I would like to emphasize that methane abatement finance has one of the highest impacts in reducing global warming per dollar of capital invested. 
and the world cannot avoid the worst impact of climate change without sufficient finance flowing towards methane abatement. So both, again, both public and private actors have an essential role to play in closing the methane abatement finance gap. And I hope that together we can really work on concrete solutions on how that can happen. And so I hope that you all will take a look at the report, which is now available on our website at climate policy initiative. Org, and I'll put the link in the, in the chat in a second. Uh, but yeah, I look forward to continuing this conversation here and to really connecting with all the different um, experts working in this uh, field, because I think the moment is now or never. And it's uh, again, it is a sprint uh, that we need to start now while also kind of continuing uh, what we're doing uh, um, in other areas. So thank you so much, uh, Marcelo, and let me pass back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bruckner. Um, for that great report, and it definitely is going to highlight the way that we design our support. And it has already, um, because we've been working on this, has already influenced the fact that, for, for example, in the recent major economies forum, the State Department and Norway have uh, announced a uh, trust fund replenishment to uh, focus on fossil fuel flaring in the MDB space, which is something that, you know, we have seen is not nearly to the level that we expect. I think it was something around hundred million dollars being spent in the track finance on the energy sector, which is far from what we wanted. And it, which goes to highlight that the fact that despite the benefits of the highest energy prices that we've had in a while and natural gas being at this highest levels, it doesn't really uh, result in, in, the, in the actions that we would expect. And the short-term uh, visions that some of the private sector players have uh, preclude them from taking the correct action that's both uh, good for the economy and for the climate. So therefore regulations, good old command and control and rules and regulations also help a lot in keeping them uh, constrained in the emissions. And so, yeah, thank you for, for that. We'll continue with, uh, with the program with Durwood. Um, um, so I just wanted to, yeah, thank you. And, 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 and Derwood uh, Zelke, who really no, needs no introduction. He's been in the space for so long. Uh, Mr. Zelke is a founder of the, and president of the Institute of Governance and Sustainable Development in Washington, D.C. and Paris, focusing on fast mitigation strategies that avoid maximum warming over the, uh, over the critical next decade in order to slow climate feedbacks and avoid irreversible tipping points. He's the author, co-author, and editor of various publications, including leading law school textbooks and in international environmental law and policy. Uh, the Washingtonian uh, named him one of the 500 most influential people shaping policy, a pioneer the, uh, uh, on the need to cut greenhouse gases outside of carbon dioxide. Zelke has described, was described by one peer as the most influential operator on climate you've never heard of. And yeah, we, 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 this is a kind words because what is invisible is also unstoppable. So your influence has been really uh, positive uh, to bring ambition and urgency to this agenda. Um, Durwood is gonna speak on the fast mitigation and rising ambition to meet the climate emergency. Durwood, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcelo. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be among so many friends. So like you, I've had the privilege of working with Professor Ramanathan for a very long time in one of the most uh, productive partnerships I have ever had. And I'm expecting it to go on for many, many more years. Uh, of course, Yang Yang, you as well, and more recently with uh, Rob Jackson. And then, of course, Gabby um, works with me. And very happy to have recruited her from the Department of Energy uh, when uh, Obama left office. So what we have uh, been discussing as the predicate for the methane hub and the effort to raise the $300 million that uh, the 23 philanthropists have put together, uh, following, as, uh, as Jorgen was saying, the model of the uh, Kigali Fast Start Fund, which became the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program, and, and was uh, quite useful for the end game uh, of the HFC phase down under the Montreal Protocol. Um, the, uh, we discussed um, and put together with the Clean Air Task Force a three-level strategy for increasing ambition. And the first level is 
to focus on the bottom-up work that's going on uh, in the, the private sector, in the subnational uh, cities and states like California, and at the national level. There's a lot of good work, and there are a lot of good NGOs and, and scientists who have been working on this for some time, and they need to have their work accelerated. And that's something that the, the hub now is able to do, Marcel, and you're already starting that. Um, the second level was to strengthen the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. This was set up under then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and was a brilliant uh, invention and got us started on the short-lived climate pollutants. Um, and it really grew out of some work that Rom was doing at uh, UNEP. And Rom, you had had the uh, Atmospheric Brown Cloud Program and we had decided that we needed more than science, we needed policy to expand. And um, Occam Steiner was, uh, was a great innovator as the head of UNIM at the time. And we coalesced uh, in the formation of the CCAC. And it is the only institution in the world that focuses on the full package of short-lived super pollutants. It is um, a pioneer, it is doing incredible work on methane. Thanks to the, the great scientific effort, and Ram is part of that. Uh, Drew Schindel, um, of course, is the lead author on the Global Methane Assessment. The CCAC has some very important computer tools that allow each country to determine how to mitigate and how that will avoid X amount of warming so they can do a more elegant and faster job enhancing their NDCs. That's a very, very important part. So what uh, should the CCAC be doing now that they have an extra $10 million? Well, that is uh, originally, as you pointed out, Marcelo, to help the first 30 states develop their methane action plans. That's a great way to move into the, the faster mitigation with methane at the, at the local and the subnational and the national level. We also need, I believe, to strengthen their scientific assessment process. It's good, but it could be even stronger. And I'll use as the model the scientific assessment panel of the Montreal Protocol. I'll use this uh, for many examples uh, in the, this part of my discussion. Uh, we also need something borrowed from the Montreal Protocol on the technology solutions. So the Montreal Protocol has the Technology and Economic Assessment Panel, the TEAP. And since that was first uh, constituted back in 1990s, uh, it has provided real-time data twice a year to the parties, to the Montreal Protocol, to show them what the best solutions are, what they cost, how they can be implemented. So it's a great uh, model. Then there's a, a further capacity building effort that the CCAC could step up even further. And the, the model from the Montreal Protocol is the uh, national ozone units that are funded by the dedicated uh, multilateral fund every year and that have in 147 developing countries and every uh, developed country as well, smart people who are trained every year to understand the technologies, uh, the economics, and how they can implement the solutions to the requirements under the Montreal Protocol. Uh, the UNEP office in Paris um, has the Ozone Action Office, which trains 11 regional networks of these national ozone units uh, twice a year again, to keep them up to date so they know exactly what they need to do to comply with their treaty obligations and reduce the fluorinated gases. So uh, if we help strengthen the CCAC along these lines, they will become an even more powerful force for mitigating methane. Then the third level uh, is the international level. So we have the Global Methane Pledge which is a terrific start. We now have 120 countries in this, uh, and um, we have the innovation that uh, Marcelo just mentioned with the last major economies forum meeting 
where the countries came together and said, we will do a specific pathway now to implement the methane mitigation in the oil and gas sector, and then uh, some money associated with that as well. So this has been a good beginning. It's a way to socialize, but we have a risk here. We have a risk that we're taking a, what could be perceived as a, a northern agenda, and we're pushing it aggressively in the South. Rom gave us probably the best presentation I've ever seen on why this is important for the South. And we need to learn how to articulate this much better as a benefit to the global South. Marcelo, you're of course very sensitive to this and you'll be a very good person to help that uh, transition as we change our narrative you know, from just the science and the, the need for speed to why this matters so much for the, uh, the global South. So the, the pledge is allowing us to socialize this issue, but it's only a pledge. And soon, and I would say uh, as fast as we can, we need to move to a mandatory international agreement. And again, I would use the Montreal Protocol as our inspiration. So the Montreal Protocol, as, as many of us know, is not only the treaty that's put the stratospheric ozone on the path to recovery by 2065, solving the first great threat to the global atmosphere, but it has also avoided more warming than CO2 is causing today, about the same amount. So we've solved what would be another half of climate change because the fluorinated gases are such strong, super climate pollutants. This was a paper Rom wrote in 1975, alerting us to the CFCs and the other fluorinated gases as super climate pollutants. So, so this treaty, which has literally saved us from uh, going over the cliff of these feedbacks and, uh, and tipping points, uh, should be studied by all of us, should be the inspiration. And if you use the, the model of the strong CCAC that we're, I just mentioned, those elements then can migrate into a global agreement. Okay, now, the Montreal Protocol was negotiated in nine months after we had a framework agreement that took a little bit longer. But when the world is scared enough, and when the story that we tell is powerful enough, the parties can move fast. Now we have a wrinkle because uh, it's more than a wrinkle. The Russian invasion of the Ukraine has scrambled energy policy in the near term. And the scramble for replacement gas for the Russian gas that's been cut off means that we will see a short-term uptick in uh, natural gas. We have to ensure that that replacement gas has minimum methane associated with it. So th this has got to be an inflection point right now as the world moves to, to meet an emergency in Europe. And I don't think we're, I don't think we have a choice here. I think the world sees and will move uh, natural gas, including, um, of course, liquefied natural gas. What we don't want is lock-in. And so this was recognized by the US and the Europeans in the, the Biden and von der Leyen agreement on the margins of the G7 just the other day. So uh, I see a path to a global methane agreement that builds on the three levels. You do the bottom up because once you show everybody that these solutions are there and they're modest in cost and sometimes negative in cost. Uh, once we get the, the funding up to the level that we should, and that's a, that's a steep curve, uh, but, but we can do that. Once we strengthen the CCAC, then we have all the pieces in place for a fast global agreement. And um, I will leave it there. Thanks so much, Derwood. Derwood. That was that was great, and of course, um, you know, I, I was just reflecting on on the fact that it, you know that we if we don't um, have a recognition of the impact of methane, the 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 marathon and the sprint, um, in 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 some sort of formal way, it's going to be difficult 
to um, that you know the uh, we have MDBs that usually take a while to convince. You know, I worked at the World Bank to convince on the climate co-benefits and having, for example, specific focus on short-term warming. It's going to be difficult, and therefore we we need to have that uh, be recognized as a, 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 a pathway that we need to to lay out. And we're not going to get increased financing and focus on this overall. But as you said, also. When we are talking about metagame methane and Hayden Montgomery, uh, who is our head of, uh, of agriculture, has a really great uh, uh, plot from an upcoming paper that highlights the methane to CO2 ratio in terms of uh, emissions for a country versus uh, GDP. And you'll notice then that in that regard, the contribution to methane to total warming uh, from uh, different countries um, this is actually a low income country challenge uh, and and it is very much about providing sustainable energy it is very much about a food system that's not wasteful and it is it is about um it is about development goals overall wastewater waste management environmental justice having people not living you know, in the middle of uh, what I could only imagine to be nightmarish conditions of high temperature and landfill fires and being exposed to the soot and the smoke and dioxins, you know, so it is about development. And that's why we're proud to be uh, having a global presence as a global methane hub. We're based out of Chile, but we also have offices in Copenhagen. We're going to have uh, offices in Senegal and, and Dakar. In the car where we have we have some of the biggest challenges you know uh, increased lng production at the same time large landfills that could be observed from space and we could really make uh reductions now and we know we've done it before and we'll, we need to achieve this so we're gonna um uh, wrap up this uh, conversation with around you know 15 minutes of questions and i just wanted to start off with uh ram ram um are there a specific uh mitigation opportunities uh, you would pr uh, prioritize uh, for increasing resilience in this local benefits that could be achieved for communities. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for asking, Marcelo. Uh, I also want to thank my good friend and colleague, Derwood Zalke, for saying some nice things about our collaboration. Um, yes, for example, <clears throat> I will choose this, as if I were the governor, and I used to talk to a governor, Jerry Brown, and he, he's no more a governor here, is that I would ban throwing food into our garbage cans. We have to you know, recycle the food, which will cut enormous amount of methane emissions leaking from landfill. And it turns out one third of the food, you know, we. Uh, the Western nations throw about 35 to 40 percent of the produced food. Unfortunately, the developed all the other nations also waste about one third of the food, not produced food, just between transporting from where the farms are there to the delivery site. Okay, roughly about a third to 40 percent is the amount of food wasted, and our population is going to increase to eight billion, nine billion. So the big worry is. How are we going to feed them? I'm thinking, just stop throwing the food. <laughs> that that uh, right there is 30% more. It turns out it's being recovered in San Diego. We have Feed San Diego. There is a Feed America program. About quarter to half of the food is really good food. It could be, you know, uh, you and I can eat them. So to process that, they give it to the homeless and others. The other food, non-edible food, it has to be collected, put into biodigester, and it produces renewable methane. Okay, and then what is left behind in the biodigester is fertilizer. It's just an enormous win-win. And so that is doable. Some counties of California are already doing that. So that would be the top of my agenda. The second, of course, I can't believe even in Western nations, gases are leaking from our pipes. In a naive way, I'm thinking it's just a question of maintaining the pipes. So those two would be my target, prevent gas leaks from you know, our transmission pipes and prevent, prevent food waste. Uh, I just want to take about 
30 seconds to address an important point Barbara made. She said, you know, I still remember criticized, claiming we can keep the warming below one and a half. And she said, it's still a desirable goal. I completely agree with that. The mitigation has to target one and a half. Sorry, I didn't make it clear. What my worry is, we are going to think we're going to avoid one and a half and let this 3 billion poor who are living in uh, Latin America, Mexico, even the US, California has 50,000 homeless, okay? And India, Bangladesh, China. So we are not putting adaptation on the same center stage. That's my problem. We are not putting enough resources. Uh, Marcelo, I'm holding a conference just on this at the Vatican with Pope Francis's blessing. We are going to bring it to the upcoming uh, COP meeting that we need to think about resilience and mitigation comes first in the resilience because if you don't mitigate, you're just going to make the risks. Nobody can adapt to anything, catastrophe. So it's not putting mitigation on the back burner, but we need to prepare for the vulnerable. You see, they total this 3 billion contribute less than 7% to the emissions. The wealthiest 1 billion contribute more than 50 to 60%. So uh, while the wealthiest has to focus on mitigation, we need to figure out in eight years, that disaster is coming eight years from now. I think of that 2031 and a half degrees as the COVID moment for climate change. Durwood pointed out in the Montreal, we had the Antarctic ozone hole. Durwood and his colleagues made the miracle happen. So I'm optimistic by 2030, the COVID moment from climate change will arrive. And I know we will have the proper policies to cut down the emissions to zero. But at the same time, there will be catastrophe unfolding for this 3 billion. Yes, and it's a great link, uh, as you're saying, with the ozone layer depletion. And my, my former um, yeah, boss at MIT, uh, Mario Molina, you know, in his great work uh, highlighting this, uh, this, this, uh, this importance. And a lot of this stuff uh, actually started in, uh, from a base in Punta Arenas, Chile, when they started measuring a lot of the ozone layer depletion. And, and this uh, next uh, winter, in, 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 the, in the US, uh, there will be a Latin American mission from uh, Carbon Mapper that will be replicating some of the work or the NASA aircraft with the, with the measuring methane. Mm -hmm. And that we hope to use that as uh, the, high, uh, the high density of the, of the warming uh, potential makes a lot of these plumes visible. And so therefore we could use this to leverage opportunities to reduce exposure to VOCs from people that are located near uh, oil and gas extraction or bad odors because of landfills. Uh, you know, so I think there's many opportunities that we could have there. And as you said on the food uh, issue, um, of course, there's things that we have identified already to be the low hanging fruit. For example, a lot of the of mayors are uh, ending the life of the landfills that they have to manage and they could extend it by diverting organic waste, uh, you know, and, and actually turning that, uh, that waste that's uh, a fire hazard uh, to, uh, to a, you know, something that could be more circular in nature. And so a lot of the work that we'll be doing is providing support for uh, legal reforms that will allow uh, organic waste diversion laws, food banking regulations, which should be done anywhere developing and developed countries still lose around 30% of the food just because of, um, because of uh, not prioritizing and having bad incentives, you know, tax deductions for destroying the food instead of making better use of it. And these are the things that we did in Chile just uh, a couple of years ago uh, too. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, to uh, Dr. Buchner, uh, are there specific models of climate finance that would be particularly well suited for methane mitigation in the fossil fuel sector, which we see uh, well, you know, such a big challenge on, or, and also regarding the waste and agricultural sectors. And yeah, no, absolutely. And I, just, just to say, I'm very happy that we are all aligned here on the overarching kind of, I think, uh, direction. On, and, and just before I come to this question, I did want to also flag, fully agree on that adaptation. It is kind of on a very high kind of 
political level at the climate negotiations. But if you look at the action on the ground, it, you're falling far behind as well. Again, if you look at the overarching, we, we've been tracking clim climate finance more generally now over, over 10 years and um, still more than 90% of overarching finance global uh, public and private is going towards mitigation. So fully agree that we need to get adaptation first um, at scale, but also to the right places, which I think is still an area where which is really lacking. But yeah, so just to, to your question, um, Marcelo, I think more generally, as I said before, I think it is, and I think that's also what my other co-panelists have said here, it is a combination of actions from both public and private actors that go just also a little bit beyond specific climate finance model. I think it does this because there's a range of key barriers to increasing finance for methane abatement, which include, uh, as, uh, as you also have you have um, um, uh, outlined before that you know the, the good old uh, policy and regulatory barriers, but also measurement uncertainties and methane abatement finance data gaps, which I don't, again don't allow us really to to come up with the right financing models. But then also a lack of support for innovation. And I think some while there are lots of, and I think it was uh, really enjoyed also uh, your kind of. Um, connections to the Montreal Protocol door, I think, which, which I very much also like, and I think it was a very successful environmental uh, agreement. But I think there we had a clear uh, technology, uh, like solutions that were there and that were aff affordable. And while I think there's lots in the methane space, there's still some that have a very high um, mitigation potential, such as feed ad ad additives or, or, you know, chemical inhibitors in, in the, you know, agriculture and the forestry and the, the land use sector, which are still early in their development cycle and require additional research and development support. So this is why, uh, again, um, I feel this is kind of more than just climate finance models, but at the same time, I also do want to stress again that there is a clear business case for it. And there is this that the clean climate and clean air coalition that estimates that 50% of the measures that abate methane come with negative costs as they pay for themselves quickly by saving money. And so some of the concrete investment opportunities I've been thinking about are uh, actually very aligned. And uh, I promise we have not been speaking before. Uh, this was um, what Ram said before. So I think uh, one of them is like, you know, um, some, some waste to energy projects that tap the gas emitted by landfills and reuse it, which I think is something that is a, a concrete investment opportunity today already. But then also, and I think this is a, a very important part because again, it should be basically mainstream into you know, um, oil and, and gas industries kind of um, operations and maintenance uh, activities, which is really measures that reduce and reuse the gas leaking from our existing oil and gas infrastructure. And again, particularly in, in today's situation, um, this the, the Russian invasion, I think this should be in the very high gas um, prices. I think this should be really um, something that, that that needs to happen very, very quickly. But then I think the third third one for me is also around feed additives that, that reduce methane emissions from cattle. And I think here it comes to the point that Rob made actually in the first panel, which Yes, there, you know, this is this is happening already, but at pilot scale. So how can you get those to scale it? I think that the one uh, just finance model I wanted to share here um, with you and, and, and everyone else is I do think we need still more innovation in, in basically blended finance models that have been that we are, you know, testing more in the in the renewable energy, but also like you know, um, agricultural. You know, more in the climate space and um, we're running an incubator at the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance, where we really help entrepreneurs uh, who come up with finance solutions uh, to really get them to a stage that you can pilot them and, you know, use public money most effectively to unlock other pools of capital. And this year in our lab, we have actually for the first time a, a methane um, mechanism. It's, it's, it's a facility that uh, finances uh, methane capture technology in the turbine waters of hydroelectric plants and the methane feeds biogas energy generators, providing therefore multiple sources of revenue, which again makes it a, a, a very interesting uh, climate finance model. So I think uh, these types of mechanisms, I think, and, and the one that you mentioned before uh, that just got announced, I think this is something we need to think more about and how can we really get uh, this um, methane uh, abatement to scale by using both public and private uh, finance uh, most effectively. And maybe let me just stop here. Uh, Marcelo, um, could I add one comment on uh, the connection between the fast mitigation of methane 
which is the single biggest and fastest way to slow warming and adaptation. These are two sides of the same coin. We can't adapt to beyond 1.5, 1.7, whatever, but certainly not beyond two. And so we have to slow warming fast to be able to keep adaptation and resilience within some reasonable bounds that we can actually do. So I think we tie them together in our storytelling better. Great. And I also wanted to um, recognize, uh, Barbara, when I was at the World Bank, uh, a lot of the, the work that we did was inspired in looking at your reports and, and showing the big gap we had of the private sector uh, on adaptation overall. And since then, you have the Resilience uh, Sustainability Trust that uh, Christina Gurgeva and the IMF have launched and have been, a, have been the derivation of this. And of course, it was because uh, it was seen as a visible risk that we needed to address, including pl climate risk was something we needed to include in the, in the, in the way that we make decisions on, on financing. And in this regard, I think we need to, in many ways, include the necessity of having this short-term sprint. Uh, we've done it partially in the Race to Zero um, a, uh, requirements for companies to join Race to Zero, in which they'll have to disclose non-CO2 emissions and their pathways to reducing methane in the short term, including also scope three emissions. So there's ways of doing this. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we'll be using uh, your report uh, for uh, for further uh, progress in mitigating uh, methane, and 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 I think the links to adaptation beyond lowering temperature is something we need to also uh, expand on. Good operations uh, that have better water and waste management in the agricultural sector will surely bring resilience and mitigation benefits uh, for sectors that are more difficult, including uh, livestock and Hayden and others. Uh, in our group are working towards this. I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, Derwood, um, because you know the, the pending question we had from Eric Gibbs initially, how consequential is this European Commission's decision to consider uh, methane to be a lower carbon fuel in the taxonomy? How does it signal uh, you know, to the world considering that we have a methane pledge overall? And a lot of countries are actually uh, looking at the EU to be the gold standard on on what what is sustainable how do how do you think what's going to happen and what should we be looking out for you know there are there are disappointments every day in uh, in our business of trying to keep the climate safe and our job is finding a way around it and this is a disappointment i mean they didn't have to do this they could have uh, bucked up, uh, but the war scared them so much that I think they, they felt they had to uh, leave it in for the moment. But we will we'll find a way around it. And uh, Eric, it's a good thing to bring up. Uh, thank you. It's certainly on my mind when I saw the, the headline. But uh, Marcelo, it just gives us another target. I mean, this is, you know, again, we, we see these Things. I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court decision is another one, and we find a way to pivot and move around and get ahead. But it's uh, it requires some creative thinking, and uh, and a lot of work on our part. Yes. Any comments on that, Barbara? Yeah, just like you, I you keep track of that a lot too. <laughs> Sorry, if I can just very very. I'm trying to kind of put stuff in the chat as well. I think. Again, you know, I think there is still a way to influence this because, you know, the Dixonway, which unfortunately has been, uh, uh, again, um, decided uh, today, uh, I think, um, it, you know, it classifies investments in gas and the nuclear-based economy, economic activities as transitional. I think there is still a lot of, lot of uh, room for influencing the definitions here and also for, you know, using whoever contacts you have uh, to see whether other countries uh, are going to kind of question this uh, this decision, my country, which is Austria, is actually probably going to 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 um, you know try to 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 go against this decision and at least highlight that there is um, that there is like real issues with with this decision. Uh, but I think there is also you know and that they also we need still to come up with the right metrics, which is also one of the, um, the key points in our report. Um, and, you know, what are the guardrails that need to be in place for investment in gas, um, you know, tackling methane, methane leakage and, and emissions in the gas supply chain could be 
an important guardrail. So, um, so that is something that could be still kind of developed uh, as the next level of this taxonomy. And then I think more specifically for, for methane abatement, the, the taxonomy also recognizes um, you know, the integration of um, biomethane and, and also the anaerobic digestion and, and, and so as kind of sustainable activities. So I think there, there are ways of still kind of trying to use this um, regulation as at least uh, a way to kind of take the good bits, you know, like trying to see how can you uh, support also the role of uh, biogas and biomethane and providing renewable heat and power, but then also kind of to, to help basically either influence the current decision or, or see how we could kind of uh, help the, the next level of going deeper and providing better definitions and metrics that could still um, have an influence in this uh, context. But certainly, yeah, certainly not, um, um, not a very positive development more generally. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, great. Um, I mean, I, I think, yeah, it's not fully lost and, and definitely they had a harder time passing this regulation than they expected because it was uh, struck down at a committee level. So I think, you know, there's much uh, more uh, to, to work on this. I just uh, wanted to thank you all uh, to, to, you know, to, to get together and, and look at the things, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we're going to have wins, we're going to have losses, but this is a marathon and a sprint. And uh, one of the positive things that are coming out uh, these days is Governor Newsom's announcement for a methane accountability program for 100 million additional funding that will allow uh, keep track and actually with a very big commitment to uh, go beyond just measuring, but making sure that this brings tangible benefits to local communities, that there are interventions that are possible to keep track of and that we could actually come up with emission reductions that are observed from space constantly. And this has been done already on landfills, this has been done on gas. And so I think this is a positive thing overall. And you know, we, had, we will have shifting uh, political leadership, but as long as the fundamental process of uh, low emissions being cheaper and more sustainable, easier to build, I think you know it will be still pretty much more resilient than people expect as an agenda. So I wanted to thank you all, uh, um, also Jurgen and 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 all the different participants uh, for keeping us up to date with the science, with the policy, and now we're just going to keep on going at this fight. That's going to be both the sprint and a marathon. Thanks so much, you guys. Thank See you, you Marcelo. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye.